Welcome to another Leon Chani Report, and I'm sitting in Jerusalem, Israel, the holy city of Israel, with a very holy man. His name is David Hartman, and uh, this show really loves him. We've done a few interviews with him. He's always uh, insightful and creative. He's a modern Orthodox rabbi, a graduate of Yeshiva University, but probably the best modern thinking Jewish philosopher in the world today, and it's always a pleasure to greet him. And uh, David, it's good to see you, first of all. First of all, Leon, I don't know about this holy man. <laughs> <laughs> but you could describe me as a person who's still looking to find his way in Judaism. If any of you who are not Jewish have never heard of Maimonides, and his name is Rambam in, in Hebrew, and I know we have a huge non-Jewish audience, uh, David is probably a clone of the Rambam, the man who was always searching. You know, the interesting thing about Maimonides is that he was uh, against uh, Kabbalistic uh, mysticism in a sense, and yet his son, in a sense, was. Yes, well, it's in Sufi mysticism influenced his son, so some people thought that Maimonides himself was a mystic. It's not that clear. I mean, Maimonides writes as a rationalist, but with a person with a passionate love for God and a mystical yearning for God. So it's very important not to put people in a box. Rationalist, emotional, mystical. It's so complex, you know, I prefer people just reading the person without placing them into a box. Similarly, people put me in a box, you know, where are you? Is Hartman, the human being is at the center of his religious philosophy, or is God at the center? Everybody wants to classify you, and by classifying, you miss the complexity. Complexity is the art of integrating a meaningful life. David, I was sitting with a uh, general the other night and he said to me, Leon, he's an ex-general, uh, you know, major general. He said, Leon, I am not really worried about Palestinian issue, not Palestinian issue. I'm, I'm worried about the social fabric of Israel. And I said to him, you know, I've read uh, 20,000 pages of Jewish history in the last year for my own project. I'm writing a book on the Kaddish of the orphan, and I want to know its emanation. And I s come out. Jews have always been tribal. What do you say to that? I mean, that's the result of a family-oriented religion. <clears throat> and the question is, who is the best child in the family? I mean, Jew, the notion, I think what he's saying, I'm not wor only worried about the social fabric of Israeli society. <clears throat> I'm worried about the fact that the conflict between Jews is the deepest issue. Yeah, that's what we really mean. It's a huge You know, issue. I mean, because the country is divided now on the Gush Katif thing along ideological grounds. Those who feel that every piece of inch of Israel is holy and you have no right to forfeit it no matter for what the larger reasons are. Because those who want to forfeit are building an Israel which has to live in the world. It has to live in relationships with the United States, live in the world. You're not living with your own song. And there are those who in some way define the Jewish reality from their own perspective. Those are the messianists. And in some way they don't have to anchor their thinking in the living currents of reality. Now you can't build a society, a Jewish society, with a million and a half Arabs in the Gaza Strip as part of the Israeli reality. And you can't, for not only for that, for the sake of a Jewish reality, you can't build a moral society which in some way is nurtured by the dehumanization of other people, the sense of control of other people's lives. In other words, people need to have an expression of their own dignity, their own freedom, their own ability to be loyal to their cultural memories. And you can't impose from the external, and we know ourselves as Jewish people, what that has done to us in history. Right. So we can't do it to others now. The Bible says you should love the stranger, I mean love the, the person who doesn't have power because you were once strangers in the land of Egypt. Your history should be a moral lesson as to how you should act to those who are other than you. So I don't see a future to Israeli society unless it regains its deepest moral compass, its deepest spiritual yearning, its deepest value anchorage in the classical Jewish tradition. 
See, I don't believe in the notion of the new Jew. But this, is, con, this concomitant, the Maccabees lasted about a hundred years, David. They started out as a grand uh, visionaries. They were going to save the Jewish nations, etc., etc. Ultimately, they they became corrupt. No question about it. And so, so the the last kingdom of the Jews post uh, the uh, second the temple of the second destruction of the temple was the Maccabees, which lasted a thousand year, a hundred years. Now, let me bring you to another point. Uh, being a little bit of a Jewish historian today, and I'm sure you and I will enjoy this. Everybody speaks about Rabbi Akiva, who was a great man, he was learned, he, he, he caught on to it later in his life, yet he was the progenitor, the backer of Bar Kokhba. Correct. Bar Kokhba's history is, uh, let's say, a, a very questionable at least. They, there are many claims by historians that had Bar Kokhba, and he was a zealot, not had initiated his revolution, the history of Judaism would be totally different today. Well, I would say that no one is immune from the corruptions of power. The rabbis always said, Al tamin ba'atzmacha ad yomotcha. Don't believe in yourself until the day of your death. In other words, the idea that you're free from sin, you've been liberated from the petty in impulses and instincts of life, you're never free. You're not free from arrogance, you're not free from the desire to control other human beings, and you have to live an awakened life. You have to have a life that doesn't, self-righteousness doesn't take over. One of the great diseases found in the Jewish people is often a self-righteous notion. Right. We have been the sufferers of history. We have been the victims of history. I always believe victims don't have to do moral renewal. They are morally pure because they suffered. I think that the greatness of Israel is they didn't want to define themselves as victims. They wanted to define themselves as a free people building a new future. That's for me the symbol of Jerusalem. I re wrote a paper some time ago on Auschwitz and Jerusalem. In other words, I live with the memory of the horror of Auschwitz, but I don't define that as for my future. My future is defined by the possibilities that Jerusalem opens up for the new future of Judaism. Israel is the greatest challenge to renew the spirit of Judaism to renew the soul of Judaism, to renew the understanding of Judaism in the modern world. So to live in a ghetto mind and to live separated from the world with no interest in what the world is about is really a return to medieval Judaism. Israel has broke away, rebelled against the shtetl and the ghettoization of the Jewish spirit. It said that the Jew could live fully in the modern world. Well, this was Mendelssohn. This was the Enlightenment. And uh, there was a great strife then between that. And there's another book that I'm looking at doing, and I'm sure you get a kick out of it, is the fight between the Babylonian Talmudist and the uh, Jerusalem Talmudist. And there's very little literature on this. It's amazing. And uh, we're, it's like the first interstitial war of, of the Jews. So who should take control? Because those people who took control took control. And the thing that always interests me, and maybe you have the answer because you're a scholar and a philosopher, what is sin? Sin is not living up to your true human potential. Period. Sin, period, is in some way missing the mark, missing the direction that your life could take. So in some way it's seen one time as a rebellion against God, who's the source of the good, and other times it can be seen as a failure to fully give expression to the image of God which is in every human being. To live a wasted life is sin. And who would interpret that? You yourself? I mean, I think the tradition people have thought and, and given a direction so you reflect on what the wisdom of the ages is. You don't sort of invent the wheel from the beginning. I don't begin as a philosopher with my own thoughts. I first listen. In listening to the tradition, I create. I don't create ab initio. And therefore, for me, the concept of what a human being could become, the direction that the human being can become, the direction of the community, the direction of the Jewish people, has found expression in much of Jewish writing throughout history. So the key is for you to get to the roots by learning right. and by understanding and then making a conclusion. And then it, making choices. It doesn't mean you have to go to B'nai Brock and ask a guy, a rabbi, if the challah should be twisted six ways or four. 
<laughs> it doesn't matter. No, not only that doesn't matter. The idea of authoritarianism is antithetical to my whole understanding of what Judaism must be. I think it's Muslim. antithetical to Judaism. I know. I, my book, A Living Covenant, was an attempt to show that the experience of God and Judaism is that God doesn't paralyze you by authority and power, but he empowers you to take responsibility. The whole idea of God in Revelation at Sinai is not authority, I, but rather from above, but is to say, I call you into relationship with me. I give you commandments because I have trust in your ability to fulfill it. So in other words, it's the greatest affirmation of the human being's capacity to fulfill his responsibility. So you can look at the Torah and mitzvah as an externally imposed, tyrannizing spiritual life. Or you could look upon it as an opportunity to liberate your own human potential. I think that would be the symbol of Moses, wouldn't it? Moses was a man who transgressed God. Then he was deprived of uh, going into to the Holy Land. Yeah, well, that's an interesting... I have an interesting spiel on that, of why Moses, you know, couldn't... I mean, what was so bad? I mean, what did he spoke to the rock? <laughs> he should have he spoke what you hid it for. So I always say, what's God doing? I mean, what is he punishing him? Because you didn't sanctify me in the midst of the Jewish people. God takes the Jews out of Egypt, splits the seas for them, gives them ten plagues, and they're always rebelling against him. So no miracle seemed to have worked. So God should have got the message. I mean, these people are a stiff-necked people, and it's going to take a long while before they become truly spiritual. So why did he get upset by Moses? Moses would have spoken, then the Jews would have been transformed. So my understanding of this is the following. Moses said, I'm tired of these people's rebellion. Nothing seems to work for them. When a leader gives up hope on the possibility of change, he can't be the leader anymore. No matter how many times you failed to be a leader among Jews or to be a leader among people, a political leader has to always believe that moral change is possible, no matter how often the failure is about. So therefore Moses couldn't be, he gave up. He gave up on being able to change the Jews. If that happens, Moses, you can't be the leader in the land. It has to be a new person. I have, that's one understanding that I have, which I think is an interesting one. It's a very interesting one. I'll tell you who espoused that formula was uh, my very close friend, Azar Weitzman. He felt that if he went, and I'm bringing back Jewish history, uh, modern Jewish history, in 1979, he resigned from the Begin cabinet. He resigned as defense minister. And the papers, everybody was predicting could be prime minister. And he said, you know, I went as far as I can. I asked Menachem Begin to do something for the Palestinians and do something for the refugees. And he doesn't want to. He's the prime minister. I have to leave. And he walked out. And this is sort of a scoop on television that was told to me by the late Asa Weitzman, who just recently passed away. And I think that's exactly what he followed. It's interesting how we put that into play here. It's oh. fascinating. You see, there's also, <clears throat> I have another read on this situation. If Moses would have gone into the land, it's a beautiful Midrash prayer. He says, let me go in as a bird. Let me, I just want to see the land. Right. I want, why does he, why do you say no? So I, I have two orientations that a leader begins a process. He can't always see the fulfillment of that process. You have to learn to initiate and work with all your heart and soul, knowing full well you're not going to see the fulfillment of your whole aspirations and dreams, number one. Number two, if he would have gone, he would have drove, drove, drove Joshua crazy. Every time Joshua would make a move, he would say, that's not what I had in mind. Second guessing. Yeah, I mean, what are you talking about? So in order for Joshua to be able to experience his own leadership, and his own ability to lead the people, he had to get Moses off his back. It's another interesting insight. You can bring that into modern history. And when I used to have these long conversations with Weitzman, who knew Jewish history, modern Jewish history very well, he said all the prime ministers went down ingloriously, from Ben Gurion to Sharet to Levi Eshkol, none of them, Golda Meir. They all went down because they didn't know when to cut. To stop. It's, it's, yes, it's very interesting. So we can make a comparison. We can be writing history here between the modern uh, Jewish uh, leaders and the Bible. And the Bible. It's Absolutely. fascinating. No, the Bible is the greatest mirror of the human condition. 
We interviewed Zakowicz, Professor Zakowicz of Hebrew University. Do you know him? Yes. And uh, you know, he thinks the Bible is the greatest story ever told. Now, who wrote it? Uh, you and him. I, I probably have some conflict over that, or maybe not. I don't know. But the one thing that you do espouse, you're an Orthodox rabbi, a modern Orthodox rabbi, but I know that you have Reform and Conservative rabbis learning in this institute. Is that right? Yes, in summertime, we have over 100 rabbis coming to study at the Institute for empowering, for refreshing, for widening their spiritual understanding of Judaism because there's always a burnout within the professional rabbinate and they need an opportunity to re-nurture their soul. And we have Reform, Conservative, studying together with the Orthodox because my view is we are people behind the book. If we study together, we are a community. We may not practice together, we may not understand the book the same way, but the book is the frame of reference. And do you have any uh, uh, problem with the way the conservatives interpret, or you give them that freedom? You, you choose your own freedom, it's modern orthodoxy. Do you have any problem? With I, am, I may be critical of what they, in other words, my, by, my pluralism doesn't mean that I agree with anything that the reform movement or the conservative movement does. Right. What it does is say, I think that there's a dignity that you have the right to build an understanding of Judaism according to the, your mindset, according to your understanding. I could then be critical. Some people could be critical of my perspective. Many people of the yeshiva world will look upon me as a heretic, right. as a person who's ruined and weak in Judaism. Fine, as long as you take issue with my ideas and you don't attack me personally. It's not an ad hominem. No, when the argument is weak, start attacking the person. So when they start attacking rabbis, one movement attacks this rabbi and that, it's a sign that they've become intellectually bankrupt. The lack of dialogue in the Jewish community between Orthodox conservative reform is a sign of its intellectual poverty, not its strength. The very fact that there can be disagreement among Jews is a sign of its health. Judaism always had that. The Talmud. Talmud is full of oh, that. It. That's right and medieval Jewish philosophy, mystics versus rationalists. I mean, this has always been. The beautiful thing about Judaism is that people gave expression to their understanding of the Torah, and they gave expression to how they wanted to serve God, and there were different views. Why did they cut off uh, three, four hundred years ago? Why, in a sense, after the Shulchan Aruch, they cut it off? What happened there? What happened to the discussion and the disagreement? It's, right. Eliezer Berkowitz, an interesting philosopher, Orthodox Wasa writes about that as well. My own view is that to live with diversity and continuous discussion requires a certain type of security and a feeling that your future is secure. When the modern world begins to invade and the options of secularism begin to invade, you feel that you have to guard. So people need a guide. The, the uh, the, the they people. need strong boundaries. You start building boundaries and walls to protect yourself from the invasions of the alien culture. Once we entered into the larger culture, we are being affected by it. So in order to make it there, they felt the need to build insulated walls. So it was fright. Sure, it's fear. And the whole idea of Israel and the whole idea of the Institute is to build a Judaism not born from fear. I'm not frightened of the modern world. I'm not frightened of William James. I'm not frightened of Freud. I'm not frightened of Marx. I'm not frightened of modern philosophy. I'm not frightened of psychoanalysis. Modern political theory, those things don't frighten me. I could read John Stuart Mill's On Liberty and feel religiously inspired and then go from there to the way I read the Bible and the read, I read Talmud. So to me, the world nurtures my soul. It doesn't paralyze me. So when you observe Shabbat as a modern Orthodox Jew, uh, it'd probably be different than a, a conservative uh, Jew because the, the conservative Jews of suburbia, they, they drive cars, they go there, but still there's some kind of atmosphere and spirit for Judaism there. So you might say, uh, okay, if, if that's the way you want to practice uh, your religion after you have studied it, then that's your... That's your I mean, I'm not going to try to impose my way on right, him, right. but I may not agree with him. Right. In other words, I have room for those who are different from me without necessarily saying that I agree with those who are different from Is yours me. done out of pleasure or out of fear of sin? Joy and love. Joy and love. Sin never enters. I don't have a God who's waiting to catch me. It's wonderful. You know, I don't think God sort of like, 
is bored with the world and he's waiting to catch Hartman with a mistake. Ah, I got you. In other words, that's not my God. My God calls me to grow, to have confidence in my ability to love and to create and to live as a mensch in the world. And so you practice the orthodoxy because it's family and community for you that you feel most comfortable with. Correct. And also because I feel it is the most, it's the possibly the deepest expression of how you build a religious community. Community requires action. Community requires a halakha, a way of going. You don't build a community only by knowledge and abstractions. It's the way of life. And I found I was nurtured by an orthodox way of life by my parents. And that nurturing is what saved me as a Jew. So I went to Fordham University. I studied with the Jesuits. But I knew my roots were in the living experience of the halakha. And therefore, the halacha is very, very important. Now, the question is, what type of halacha? How does the halacha get understood? And who mediates the halacha that's for? Right, that's right. Oh, that's those other. Don't the... forget, I remember that your father said, hair will grow on its palm before you'll be a philosopher. Right. No, my, that, mother, my mother used to come, I used to come home, and my mother would ask me, what do you do? I say, Ma, I think. And she would say, Yiddish from Das Machman Aleiden. Do you make a living from thinking? I say, Mom, I want you to know you can make a very nice living. So if that's so, she said she didn't mind. As long as you can make a living from philosophy, she didn't mind that. Although she was a Haredi woman from Tzvat. Right? Yeah, my father was born in Jerusalem, in the old city. My mother was oh, born in Tzvat. That. Yes, it's a whole family of generations. If you go into the Haredi world in, in Jerusalem, most of them are my cousins and mishpocha of us. The Hartman family. Oh, so you had a very interesting and I would say tough experience uh, growing up in Haredi and becoming philosopher. Philosophers don't start becoming philosophers at uh, 25. There's something indigenous to their character when they're 10. They do have this tremendous curiosity about how everything works. And uh, I know I'm a graduate of Yeshiva University and you are. Uh, there were guys who started asking questions and uh, sometimes the, the stick came down and if I remember correctly you went to Chaim Berlin which is a ultra-orthodox uh, yeshiva, and if you ask the question, I remember I got put back uh, two years for asking a question about the Haggadah. I never real said this on television. So I went to see Rabbi Weiss, who was the head of Rabbi Jacob Joseph, and he said the question was Elui, and he skipped me two grades. <laughs> but I was questioning, and that was... Uh, well, that, well, the whole idea of the Haggadah Seder is a question. You can't begin without a question. In other words, without That's a right. question, four questions. the four questions. I mean, to be a Jew, in fact, I, I'm critical of Israeli society. They, they define the secular person who became left religion, Choser B'She'ela. He returned to questioning. And the person who became religious is called Choser right. B'Tshuva. Right. Now, Tshuva also can mean answers. Right. So no, they, they define the religious person as one who has answers, and the secular person as one who has questions. For me, it's just the opposite. The religious person is the one who lives with conflicts because he brings expectations to life. When my son-in-law, God forbid, was killed in the Lebanese war as a pilot. I remember. So people used to say, Hartman, well, you're a believer in God. That's not a real problem. It's we secularists who have a problem. I said, just the opposite. Because I believe in God, I'm constantly wrestling with how can God have allowed a young man to be killed so early in his life. Right. So no, the religion doesn't give you a, a pill to relax you. Religion challenges you to rethink. I often told my congregants when I was a rabbi, religion solves your problems by giving you new ones. So the question is, what's the type of problems you have to deal with in your life? Religion casts the individual into much deeper issues about who he is, the quality of his relationship, the quality of his soul, the yearning for holiness, all those different, sets you into a different mindset in a different universe of discourse. So it's not a milton, it's not a pill you take. It's not the opiate. So I wrote a book in sh trying to show against Marx that the covenant is an empowering experience. It energizes you to face life with responsibility and not run away from life.